Um, so without further ado, Richard, a very warm welcome. It's great. Thank you for, for joining us this evening, giving up your time. Um, and it's great to have you here. And as I say, be able to actually sit back and talk about the music in a more relaxed way outside of the recording sessions and the demands of the record labels for this, that and the other bit of information. So you're very warmly welcome here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. So I thought as it, what would be nice for everybody just to give us a little bit of context is if you could tell us a bit about your background and mm. you know, what, what, mm. what was your musical training, where was it and um, how did you get into composing and tell us a little bit about your life in uh, as a composer and perhaps the composers that have influenced you along the way. Mm. Great, thank, thank you very much. Um, well, I think I suppose it all started um, as it does for a lot of people. I, I was a chorister at Ripon Cathedral in Yorkshire and um, that was where I think I first came into contact with all the greats of the Anglican church music and um, <clears throat> I think uh, I suppose there were two great uh, momentous discoveries I suppose there for me one was performing this music which of course was extraordinarily beautiful and wonderful and we sang everything from plain song through bird, through Purcell, through to the present day. In fact, a lot of very contemporary music as well at the time. But I think also for me, what was important was that I started to think about why on earth would the composer write a piece like this? Why, why does Purcell sound like Purcell? And why does Elgar sound like Elgar? And what made people sit down and create something that sounds so distinctive to them and is so expressive and so communicative to, to everybody else. And also, of course, so wonderful to perform. And I suppose that was where it all started. And then I suppose I carried on as a performer, a singer, string player, etc., through my school years. And towards the end of that period, I got into correspondence with Benjamin Britten um, who was really in the last, about the last five years of his life. And it was at the time of some wonderful premieres of his works, um, particularly the operas Owen Wingrave and Death in Venice, but a number of the other um, of his great last works, including the third string quartet. And uh, that was also extremely um, stimulating to um, be corresponding with a composer like that wh whose music we had sung and I uh, had always made a huge impression on me um, and that was a great stimulus to composition and set me thinking about how one might do this um, and then I suppose lastly fortunately I went to Christchurch Oxford and I read music there with Simon Preston and Francis Greer and they of course also were wonderful performers of music but very, very interesting. And Francis, of course, Francis Greer himself, a, a most wonderful composer. Mm. So they, those were the real influences, I think. Um, but I think it must have dawned on me very early on that if I possibly could, I, I really would want to go and be a composer. I wanted to see if I could actually write music as these great forebears had done. Yeah. So that was really how it came about. And after that, I carried on writing, um, obviously, a lot of church music but more recently some instrumental and chamber music, much more instrumental and chamber music now. Um, and it's, it's really just built, built from there and, uh, and had a lot of discussions with organists around the world and uh, conductors of, of, of all sorts. And of course, Michael, your good self. <laughs> And so interesting when you, you mention obviously great composers like Britain, you know, a real mm. favourite of mine. And, um, you know, Britain's work spans a huge period of his lifetime, a huge mm. uh, range of genre. Um, mm. And you were saying that you've moved towards some chamber music, uh, perhaps later in your, in your composition. Mm career and you've composed choral music throughout all of that time mm. would you say yes. that your approach to writing choral music has changed either stylistically or or in any other way if that's been one of the main staple genre of your output well it certainly is one of the staple parts of the output um, it's very difficult to from where I'm sitting to put one's finger on the way in which stylistically it might have changed. I mean, so if you take the, the works on this disc, 
uh, coming out tomorrow, um, which of course is hugely exciting. But I mean, these works are, um, uh, are, are, are really, uh, I think, characterized by a response to the words. So when I look back at some of these pieces, um, they're not actually stylistically very different, some of them, from what I'm writing right now. Um, but there are also, uh, on a couple of occasions, uh, critics or uh, uh, people listening have said, oh, well, this piece seems to represent you heading off in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And that's probably true. You get that sense. Uh, when I look back on one of the pieces, for example, of which this was said, I thought, yes, actually, if you, if you, if you looked at it from the point of view of a, a listener or a performer and you compared this with what had gone before, it does look like quite a big a big step away in perhaps into a new direction. So I think probably one's become certainly more adventurous over the years. Um, I think one's, I think I've become more economical. I think I've become, uh, uh, there's less, um, uh, there's certainly no excess music in there anymore. It's very much uh, directly what I would like to say. But as I say, sometimes stylistically, uh, in fact, I just finished a choral piece for a choir in Germany and playing it through, I think actually, you know, this is quite similar to some of the, <laughs> the early pieces stylistically. So I don't, it's a difficult question to answer. Yeah, and I must say that actually when I was on my own going through the process of looking through your music and we were then deciding on what we might program together that yes there are pieces from that are are stylistically a little bit different but there isn't a great line in the sand between things that are obviously early work mm -hmm. perhaps you know one might say were naive or slightly mm -hmm. uh, less accomplished rather than things that have been written more recently so uh, and I think that's a that's a great testimony to your writing that um, there is a that there is a sort of timelessness to it in terms mm. of your output um, I think it's time for a little bit of music in which case so I'm going to play the first of our videos tonight which is one of the tracks off the disc called creator of the starry height um, now Richard I'm going to hand this one over to you to introduce tell us a little bit about the piece um, where did it where did the uh, the inspiration to write it from come and uh, tell us about the text because actually as you said mm. you know, responding to the text is, is perhaps the most important thing and this is an amazing text which I'd never come across until hearing this piece of music so tell us a little bit about this. Oh well the, it is an extraordinary text um, it's actually a Latin 7th century text and uh, translated by the great J.M. Neal who I think a lot of people will be familiar with in their hymn books. He translated quite a lot of Latin uh, um, hymns. And this is a very famous Advent hymn. And it really talks about the, uh, the, the transition from darkness into light. Um, and so it's obviously specifically for Advent. It's very much about the coming of, of Christ um, and our looking forward to that. And the words talk of, um, of, of the desperate need of the world, if you like, for the saviour. And the music um, transitions from a very quiet organ introduction uh, through into a kind of narrative section with two, uh, uh, two verses, each with a solo, a soprano and a tenor. And then a couple of verses at the end with the full choir where the organ is going full pelt and the choir comes in, in with this sort of almost rollicking tune um, of feeling that the advent of the Saviour is, is close, as it were. Um, the, the work was commissioned by St Edward's School in Oxford, and it came about through a rather strange, in a rather strange way, because they were having a fundraiser for uh, the development fund for the school. And, I, uh, and the director of music said, how about writing something for us? And we will auction uh, this piece in an auction of promises. Ah. So they had an evening where they had, I don't know how many hundred <laughs> parents in the, in the main hall there, um, all bidding uh, money for uh, various things, various projects or committing whatever. And this was one of the promises that was auctioned. So um, it got auctioned, uh, got written. And then, um, then they performed it in, in, in at the Advent Carol service in the chapel of St Edward's School in Oxford, and, and it went off like an absolute firecracker. It was terrific. Fantastic! It really is a kind of journey from zero to a hundred over the <laughs> minutes, isn't it? <laughs> it is. um, 
So without further ado, I will put the video on now. I'm also posting this amazing text in the chat channel. So um, if you like to follow the words, then please have a look in the chat now um, and I'll hand over to a little bit of music. It's an amazing um, journey, 
dramatically and musically over a very short space of time and quite the workout for the organist as well. Uh, yes, lots of admiration for Jeremy who did an absolutely <laughs> sterling job between all of that. Um, if you're, for those of you who are interested, we recorded this in St Mark's Regent's Park, um, sort of Camden, Primrose Hill part of London. Um, and as ever, recording anywhere remotely near a city, um, it was done at sort of the depths of night at nine, ten o'clock at night to try and reduce uh, extraneous noises from the outside and we also did it right at the beginning of January when things are generally a bit quieter too. There's a fantastic big three manual Walker organ in St Mark's which is um, perhaps disproportionately big <laughs> given the size of the building but for this kind of music where the organ is such an integral part it was it's a real uh, coup being able to have an instrument like that to record it with and as an aside Regent's uh, records were actually formed uh, the guy that used to run the music at St Mark's Regent Park then uh, started Regent the record label so it has quite the sort of uh, heritage of recordings and recorded music in that space. So moving on from, um, from there, obviously a, a great and powerful uh, religious text there as we've discussed, but um, one of the things that I was very conscious of, as I think you were too, Richard, is that uh, there should be a balance of sacred and secular music um, on the disc. Of the, the uh, several sacred pieces, two of them are canticle settings, the Idis Christi and the St Paul service, Magnificat and Nunc Dimittis, and obviously those texts being the real cornerstone of the Evensong um, liturgy. Um, I really wanted to include both of those settings um, for reasons that are very obvious to us, but would you explain to everybody why we obviously included those because they're such well-known religious texts, but why those two settings and give us a little bit of background to each of those? Yes, yes, thanks, certainly. Um, well, these two were written within a space of about three years of each other and were both in response to commissions from Stephen Darlington at Christ Church Cathedral, Oxford, and John, the late John Scott of St Paul's Cathedral in London. And one of the wonderful things about putting these two uh, canticles on the disc is that they are, although they're exactly the same words, and very familiar words, of course, to anybody uh, who's used to uh, Evensong, as you say. The musical settings are quite different. The Christchurch setting is for upper voices, so really trebles in three parts, really, uh, mostly in two, but in some in th uh, instances in three parts. And the St Paul's setting for lower voices, uh, altos, tenors and basses, and this was what the two uh, organists requested. The style of the music is utterly contrasting because Christchurch, of course, is a a very small cathedral um, and with, a, with very little acoustic, as opposed to St Paul's, the huge size of it and the huge acoustic gives a completely different kind of uh, environment in which for these pieces to be performed. So the Christchurch one with the boys is, is, has got a lot of energy, it's got a lot of drive, it's got quite jazzy bits in it, it's, it's all very light and thrusting and um, quite exposed, a lot of it. But you've got a combination of uh, uh, virtually no acoustic and the Riga organ in Christchurch, all of which give you great opportunity to have some fun with something a bit more interesting, a bit more lively. Um, the St Paul's, of course, is completely the opposite. It's a much mellower work. It's, uh, one where you've got to take account of the fact that um, things will get caught up in this huge acoustic and making it clear and the words clear and the music clear means that you've got to be very careful in uh, how much um, uh, sort of dynamism there is in, in, in the writing. Um, but funnily enough, uh, the, the, they've both been performed in other places uh, and it works, they work perfectly well elsewhere. But the contrast is there really because of the very different nature of the buildings and the organ and also the sound of the choir. The boys at Christchurch uh, trained in a particular way to sing in that building, to be effective in a building like that. And the same is true, of course, of St Paul's, where it's a, it's, it's a different, uh, different matter, but nevertheless has to be very specific for the building. I liked the, the fact that these two settings provide a, a bit of an anchor to the disc as well. One mm. of the 
the dangers with programming CDs is that you end up with 28 tracks all lasting a minute long or two minutes long and mm. sometimes be very hard to provide a bit of structure but actually you know a Magnificat and a Nunc Dimittis you've, you've got two contrasting texts straight mm. away which are mm. quite big texts and we've got two contrasting ses uh, settings as you've just described um, mm. which you, you, I think complement each other really really well and provide a nice sort of anchor and structure to the programming of the whole disc mm. so moving aside from those big big sacred texts two of the uh, secular numbers on the disc that um i w was particularly drawn to um one was the setting of the stephen crane poems um mm. now i i didn't know anything about stephen crane and um the these settings are in marked contrast in the way you've written them to some of the uh, sacred texts. Could you just tell us a little bit about these amazing poems and, and how mm. you approached your music making in response to them? Mm. Yes, you're quite right. And this, and this work, The Four Poems of Stephen Crane, is the most recently completed work on the disc, uh, written in 2013. Well, Stephen Crane was an American writer, um, better known for his fiction and he wrote one particularly famous book called the red badge of courage which is an account of the american civil war and it is an astonishing book uh, for its depth um, uh, in terms of it, it, it follows one particular individual and their experience of the war and it really is quite a harrowing story uh, crane himself uh, died at the age of 28 uh, having written a number of books, and he's even less well known for his poetry, um, funnily enough. But the same questioning, if you like, within the, the red, red badge of courage, in his, for example, in his fiction, which is the internalization, if you like, of, of what we are experiencing, uh, this also filters through into his poetry. So these four poems are really uh, variations on a theme, if you like, of uh, an examination in many ways of the nature of the relationship between uh, mankind and God or man's search for God if you like mm. and so they explore different aspects of that search and uh, I just thought uh, I would use the piano here rather than any other kind of instrument and have this as, as a kind of series or a little cycle of um, part songs effectively for choir with piano but they do form an almost sort of sonata-like structure in a way, with the third movement being faster and lighter and actually unaccompanied. And um, that's really where, where it came from. And I think the idea was to see if the music, and the music is, is, is uh, it's more challenging than the other, some of the other works on the disc. But um, rather like Crane's poetry, um, if you make the effort, and go in and listen and listen a few times then these things start to come out at you and you start to begin to get the picture of the whole piece and there's quite a lot in there um i absolutely love the poems and i'm very fond of american 19th century literature so it was in many ways a, a natural choice and i found these very very stimulating pieces to to set to music and um segueing nicely to another text that is a sort of a reminiscence on life and god and mankind um king henry the eighth's apologia um i think is just a wonderful text and it is apparently attributed to the the king himself um it's the most amazing setting musically it's incredibly virtuosic and um one of those pieces that's difficult on paper and even more difficult to read <laughs> and do a good performance of. But just give everybody a, a, a little um, description of this amazing text for those who don't know it. And I didn't know it again before coming across your setting of it. Yes, well, this, this, uh, this text was allegedly uh, by Henry VIII, um, King Henry VIII, who was the founder of Christ Church, Oxford. And they it was who commissioned the work for the 450th anniversary celebrations. So uh, Stephen Darlington, who was the director of music said, we need something sort of Christchurchy or Henry VIII-ish. And in fact, he sent me a copy of the text. He said, I've dug this out of the library. Um, whether or not it's actually by Henry VIII, we don't really know, but we think it is. 
and uh, but have a go and i mean it's an absolutely lovely text actually because he he is and uh, hence the title of, the, of 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 my work anyway he, he's really saying I, i'm really not such a bad bloke you know you you guys are really down on me um <laughs> i've only done the same things that everybody else has done. when you were young didn't you go and do all these things as well and and when i married you know i am serious about marrying uh, and all this sort of thing so it's a way of him or, 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 uh, if you like, explaining perhaps uh, some of his indiscretions. And it's, it's really rather amusing. Um, and, and so the, and he takes us through various different elements of his life that he is trying to um, uh, relieve himself of blame for. And uh, so the, the piece is in sort of four, four, four or five sections as we go through these um, with a little refrain at the end of it. Uh, which says, and some people say that I'm governed by youth, by my youth, as if to say, how ridiculous could that be? And um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely little piece by him. And uh, so I thought I've got to put this, this can't be a, a kind of withering violet piece. This has got to be something that's out there and uh, where he's standing there with his chest, you know, beating his chest about how clever and brilliant he really was. Absolutely. It is the turbocharged Ferrari of Coral. <laughs> it's a absolutely wonderful piece. And who knows, maybe we'll rewrite history slightly with our, uh, <laughs> with our <laughs> communication of these words, if they are indeed by him. Um, so your music is published and distributed and performed across the world and, and has been for many years. Um, the process of actually recording music is is a more uh, permanent um, and in a way defining process because uh, live performances exist in the moment and then they they go and every performance is different and every choir and every conductor and pianist and organist is different how do you find um, having your music recorded is it quite an inhibiting process because you're immortalizing one person or one group's version of the music does it impact on you at all or actually is it just a very nice way of approaching having your music performed? Well I certainly don't find it remotely intimidating. I, I, I'm actually, I, I love it, I think it's absolutely great and it also actually this gives me a wonderful opportunity actually to to thank you and the London Choral Symphonia for the incredible commitment that you personally, but the choir as well, have shown to all this music. I mean, it really means a huge amount. Because the thing is that um, it's no use writing all this music if no one ever listens to it, um, or if it doesn't mean anything to anybody. And so this immortalization idea, yeah, it's very important. I don't mind in the slightest um, that you have chosen to interpret these pieces in this way. Um, and uh, you've done so uh, uh, without really veering at all from, from what I would consider to be uh, really authentic and brilliant performances. And um, I, I, th I don't think one should be afraid of the fact that other people might take these pieces and do something different with them. And very often, actually, to, you asked about what does it feel like to hear when the things are being recorded? Well, I mean, very often I'm hearing things that I haven't actually heard since I first wrote the piece <laughs> and that's wonderful and you suddenly think oh yes I remember why I did that now and 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 isn't it great that this conductor or this choir have got this particular uh, way with this music and for, for me one of the very experiences of these recording sessions was watching you and the choir and the organist and the pianist kind of working through this into this repertoire and finding such a great way to express it and all the connections that there are between these various pieces mm -hmm. so i'm not i'm not at all worried about uh, the recording I, I love the recording process i think it's great it means that your uh, your rendition your interpretation of these pieces is is there and the most important thing i think from the composer's point of view is you've got to uh, it's a great privilege to be able to work with such great performers and I, you know we have to trust you to do it and um, of course the results are wonderful. Thank you, it's very kind of you to say that and I must say I, I will add that I find the recording process actually very rewarding. An outsider mm. may look at it and think it's terribly fragmented and a bit unnatural but actually unlike a rehearsal for a con conventional concert where in the performance itself 
you just have one shot at it and that can bring all sorts of excitement to it don't get me wrong but in a recording environment you can just keep going back over and doing it again and mm. doing it again and i think when the atmosphere is right you can have that electricity and that charge in a recording context even without an audience i think if if the uh, if the stars align in a recording session they can be as exciting and as rewarding music making as, as a live concert can be yes Anyway, we're going to finish now with our second piece, um, which is Spirit of Mercy. Um, Richard, could you introduce this for us and tell us again about the, the piece and its context and the text? Yes, this is um, Spirit of Mercy. Uh, the words come from the Foundling Hospital collection in London uh, of 1774. So we don't know the identity of the author, <coughs> excuse me, um, I just, uh, th th this was one of two anthems that I wrote, um, funnily enough, not for a commission. So this was just, I found two texts. One was called Palms of Glory and the other one was Spirit of Mercy. And I just thought, I like the text and I thought I'd see if I could set them. So that's how it came about. And in fact, because uh, I didn't actually have any performance in mind when I wrote it, there was quite a long gap between the completion of the work and its first performance. It was actually first performed in South Africa. And I must just tell you, I mean, the, 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 the South Africans absolutely adore this piece, um, especially the black South Africans. And there are a number of concerts I can tell you I've been to where this thing's been performed and they've literally been sort of up on their feet you know, shouting and, and, and clapping and everything before the piece is even finished. So it's a very, again, it starts very quietly, and it builds up into uh, into uh, really a, a sense of wonder at uh, God's glory at, uh, at the, and, and these wonderful words. And uh, so it, it started off life actually as a piece for just for upper voices and organ. And then at the behest of the South Africa, the Chamber Choir of South Africa, who premiered it, uh, I, I made it a version for four part choir, which is the version that we hear on this recording. Super, I'll plus play now.
Great, a really, really wonderful piece of music, a real favourite of mine there, um, which just leads me to say thank you again so much, Richard. It's great to actually talk about the music and hear your thoughts and some of the background to all of it.